this, which are theoretical libraries have done some work on, although others did work previously, is to start out by creating, taking one electron and parking it into a very high intercircular orbit, with n equals 300 or 600 or something like this. So here we've got this localized electron going around. And then you excite the inner electron to a state of something like n equals 100. Now remember, we control the orbital motion of the outer electron with an external drive field. If this electron is moving around, this inner core is going to be strongly polarizable, so you'll induce a dipole in this. So as the electron goes around, the induced dipole will follow. But the induced dipole will also be exerting a field on the outer, on the outer electron. And if that interaction is such that they'll both stay in step, you have the potential of, keep, of getting a two electron excited state that might live a long time. There's another possibility, this is called the planetary atom. It's like the Bohr equivalent of helium in some sense. There's also the possibility of creating a flow frozen planet configuration. The nucleus for this is here. So you have one electron which is kind of quasi stationary out here, wiggling up and down in this location. The other electron has a high, highly elliptical orbit pointing towards it. And it turns out these two can exchange angular momentum. And at least for limited periods, classical calculations suggest that system will be stable. Now, those are experiments that I've been describing with beams of Rydberg atoms. Now I'd like to do, and to, to shift gears slightly, and talk about experiments with cold Rydberg gases. And in particular, our initial experiments were on the evolution of a cold Rydberg gas into an ultra-cold neutral plasma. Now, this has been discussed by a number of people, including Tom Gallagher and various others, and this transition from a cold Rydberg gas into an, into an ultra-cold neutral plasma results because collisions induce L-changing and also produce some free electrons. These free electrons then run around and induce further ionization, and ultimately you end up with avalanche ionization. Now you would expect the rate at which avalanche ionization was to occur would be sensitive to the nature of the interactions. Were the interactions between the Rydberg atoms attractive or repulsive? If they were attractive, you would expect then the, uh, uh, the avalanche ionization to occur more quickly than if they were repulsive, trying to keep them apart. Okay? So we to monitor this evolution from into an ultra-cold neutral plasma by monitoring L-changing and ionization by observing the fluorescence from the core ions. As L-changing occurs, the core ions become visible and obviously they're visible after ionization. So by imaging the core ions, you can get spatial and temporal resolution as to what is going on. Now you can obviously speed up this avalanche ionization process if you superpose a seed ultra-neutral plasma on top of the Rydberg gas, because then I've already got electrons. So they will promptly ionize all the Rydberg atoms, and that ionization process will have occurred very quickly. Now, why would one want to do this? Well, this is, in fact, the first step in a process towards the production of a really cold, ultra-cold to neutral plasma, taking advantage of dipole blockade. So the idea is you create Rydberg atoms, which were dipole blockaded. So they'd have a sort of ordered structure. And then what you would do is you'd put on a seed ultra, ultra-cold neutral plasma, have those electrons ionize the various Rydberg atoms, and you'd end up with a plasma with well-ordered ion cores. Now, the way people produce them at the present time is you just have Rydberg atoms or photoionize these cold atoms, and they're in random places. They're not ordered. So the first thing that happens is the core ions find themselves not in equilibrium, so they start moving around. And this is called disorder-induced heating because of the initial disorder of where the ionized ions were originally formed. In principle, you can get rid of that by do better than an order of magnitude colder if you can locate where those Rydberg atoms are and where those ion cores are following ionization of Rydberg atoms. So the way we do the experiments is illustrated here. We load about 10 to the 9th atoms into a MOT, and then you turn off the trapping beams of the field cards. Then we turn on two Rydberg excitation beams that counter-propagate, producing about a million Rydberg atoms. 
We then allow them to evolve for somewhere between one and say 10 microseconds, and then we image them using a 500 <coughs> nanosecond laser pulse at 422 nanometers. That laser pulse actually is crossed, so it's coming this way, and then we image the fluorescence using a couple of lenses and a CCD, okay? We can also superpose a weak seed optical neutral plasma on the atoms, and we have two pulse lasers to do the photoionization, and they cross here, okay? So we then look at what we get by observing the fluorescence. So here we've created about a million 5S, 48S, single S Rydberg atoms in a cloud which is about 1.3 by 3 millimeters. So it's 1 by 3 millimeters. Now, if we just create Rydberg atoms and look half a microsecond later, you see basically nothing. There are no core ions visible. So everybody is still in a low L state. We then put on the seed and look at the same time, and now you see a lot of Rydberg core ions. So what's happened is we've got either L-changing or ionization, and this has occurred on a sub-microsecond time constant. Okay? So we've got very rapid ionization of the river gas. <coughs> you say, well, hang on a minute, you've produced a seed, ultracold neutral plasma, doesn't that give you a signal? It's a very weak ultracold neutral plasma, and here if we just have to see <coughs> the number of ions that cause it in it are just unobservable. So, you can then take this signal, subtract it from that signal, and you get the signal due to Rydberg atoms. Okay? So, what you see is that indeed, you can see L changing in ionization, and you can speed it up by using an ultracold neutral plasma, and you don't distort the distribution. So, then what you can ask is say, well, okay, we'll turn off the ultracold neutral plasma, we'll just let it evolve naturally into a plasma. So again, we here create either about a million 48S single D0 or about a million single D2 rhythmic atoms, and then we monitor the evolution of the visible core ions. So here's data taken with S states as a function of time, 1.3, 4.1, 7, 9.8 microseconds later. Here's data taken with the D state. And you see that as time goes on, the core ions become increasingly visible either due to L changing or due to ionization. And you see that the rate at which they become visible depends on the state, whether we have S states or D states, okay? It's more rapid for S states, which happen to have an attractive interaction, than it is for D states, which happen to have a largely repulsive interaction, okay? So you can see this by looking at the number of visible core ions as a function of time. If you look for, say, the S state, you see that that builds up quite quickly, a much slower build-up for the D state is going to take a considerably longer time. Okay? So we're able then to have, so this, this fluorescence provides a valuable diagnostic. You can image the time evolution, the spatial evolution, everything together. So that's a really great advantage in strontium. So the question is, I've got still about 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the question is then, what are we planning to do with cold atoms, okay? Well, we're going to try and tune the interaction between those cold atoms by Rydberg atom dressing. I'm not an expert on this, others know more about it than I do, so I'm feeling a little nervous sitting here telling them, talking about this. <laughs> but anyway, these are the kinds of things we hope to be able to do. There may be things that we don't understand that are going to give us real trouble, okay? So the idea is that we would like to, by addressing the Rydberg atoms, introduce an admixture of Rydberg character into the ground state atoms, and by putting in different amounts of Rydberg character, control their interactions. Okay? So that's the basic idea. Now, this picture here shows you the essential parameters when you're talking about Rydberg dressing. Here's the ground state. We take a laser, which is the 2 by delta P from the P state, we have a Rabi frequency, say omega p for that transition, and the p state has some decay rate down the pit. We have a second laser that takes you from here up to the, the Rydberg level with a final d2 of delta, a, a, a Rabi frequency omega r, and some decay rate from the Rydberg state gamma r. Now, if you go to large d tunings on this intermediate state, then the effective two-fold on Rabi frequency can be written as just 
omega is the product of the two separate Raman Raman frequencies over twice the magnitude of the detuning. Okay? And if you have dressing, the wave function for the dressed ground state is given by this. It's partly in the ground state, and it has now this admixture of Rydberg character, which depends on the two photon Rabi frequency and the detuning. Okay? So by tuning omega and by tuning delta, in other words, tuning this character in the excited state, then you should be able to tune atom atom interactions. So that's the plan. So if you have isotopic interactions, the effective interaction potential for large separations, way well beyond the blockade radius, given by something of the form. So one of the rods of the six van der Waals potential with some constant. This constant is not the usual C6 constant, but rather it's a C6 constant modified by omega and delta, the tuning and the Rabi frequency. And our, the blockade radius, remember, is given by C6 over this to the sixth power. Now, the interesting thing is that because of blockade radius, you get a saturation of the interaction at small r, and that means an overall effective potential that looks like this. It's got a blockade radius down here in the bottom. And then again, you can express it in terms of the Rabi frequency and the detuning. Okay? Now, if you have <coughs> large internuclear separations and only weak dressing, you would expect binary interactions would dominate just interactions between the neighboring particles, and you would get what are called broadly tuned less wave interactions. If you go to high density samples and a strong dressing, then people suggest you'll get novel collective interactions. So, one of the advantages of using strontium is you can get very long sample lifetimes. Now, if you create a Rydberg atom, then it rapidly decays, either through collisions, interactions with black body radiation, or whatever. If, however, you simply dress a state, then its lifetime or its decay rate, its decay rate decreases and its lifetime can become quite long. So you can get increased coherence times. Now the decay of a dress state is due to light scattering and that occurs at a rate which is given by this. Okay? So this is the effective decay rate. It's the square of the Rabi frequency for the first transition over the detuning for that square. This is, remember, the decay rate for the P state plus an additional term which is typically small. So, you can reduce the decay rate, then, by increasing delta P, by increasing the detuning. The problem of that is, if you decrease the detuning, you also decrease the two-photon Rabi frequency. And it's the two-photon Rabi frequency that's mixing in the Rydberg state and introducing the new, car the new, um, the new interactions that we're trying to see. Now, if you're doing an experiment of this type, what you would like to do is you're trying to tune the interaction between the cold atoms, the cold Rydberg atoms. Now, it's going to take some time for that interaction to do something that you can see. Okay? So you have to have some minimum time for, that re for, that in for those interactions to give you a visible, discernible signal. And if you have to have a certain interaction time, you need gamma effective, basically, to be fixed. The K-rate has to be fixed. That lifetime has to be such that you have the time to see what you want. Now, if gamma effective is fixed, then omega p varies as 1 over the square root of gamma p, this term. Now, this suggests, then, that we should dress the atoms by going by the intermediate p state. Because if you go by the intermediate triplet p1 state, then what you have is a state which is in a combination line and it has a very small rate of decay. It's 2 pi 10, 7, 7 by 5 kilograms, okay? So that state, that gamma there, is very small, okay? Now, that means that we should be able to get 30 times larger 2 fold um, Rabi frequencies for a given value of gamma effective, a given available time of experiment, than you can get for the alkalis. Because here, these, these rates are measured in kilohertz, whereas if we were doing, dressing by an intermediate p-state, they'd be measured in megahertz. So we have an advantage that we can, in principle, get longer coherence times by exciting by a triple p-level here. 
So we've started some experiments now where we're trying to control the interactions in an 88 strontium BEC. So we introduce tunable repulsive interactions by, red, by dressing with light that's red detuned from the repulsive Rydberg Rydberg potential. And we're producing triplet S ions. Now, if you get low atom densities, you get binary interactions that dominate, and the S wave scattering is given by this, and again depends on the dressing. Now, at high densities, remember blockade becomes important and it saturates the interaction. And you can get a crossover to many body interactions if you really tune. Okay? But the idea is that the interactions that we introduce by dressing will distort the density and momentum distributions in the BEC. And these we're trying to observe. So basically what we do is we create a BEC in an optical dipole trap. So it's a cross dipole trap. So here's the BEC. It's in this region. We turn off the beams. We then dress it with this repulsive triplet state for about a millisecond. Then we let the atoms fall. And then we image the spatial distribution about 20 milliseconds later by fluorescence. And hopefully as the interactions change, <coughs> the, end, the momentum distribution of the, of the uh, BEC will change. So as they fall, you'll see them spread out and get a different pattern. 20 milliseconds later. Okay? And as I said, we're pumping on the triplet system using radiation at 689 to the P state and then 320 nanometers going on. We're building a new apparatus to do this, but we have started some preliminary experiments. We have a 320 nanometer laser system, which has the potential of producing about 400 milliwatts in the UV. We have excited transitions to N equals 300 to N equals 30 to 150 from the triplet P2 level, and to N equals about 30 from the triplet P1 level. Those are not restricted other than by what the initial version of our laser could do. It's now being upgraded and it can do even better things. And we measure trap loss by ground state fluorescence that results from Rydberg excitation. And here are a couple of spectra that we see. Now we're tuning. This is the two photon detuning. This is the atom number. We observe excitation by trap loss. If you produce a Rydberg atom and it's in the BEC, it just gets kicked out of the trap. If it's in a cold gas sample, which we haven't converted to a BEC, it's just a cold gas cloud, then if you create Rydberg atoms, you can, get rid you can lead to ionization, or you can get them going into long-lived states which don't fluoresce. We're measuring, remember, the number of atoms by fluorescence. What we see is we see good excitation, but the widths of these lines are megahertz. There's a couple of megahertz. They're surprisingly large. That was a big surprise to us, because if we're going to do Rydberg dressing, you need narrow line widths so you can tune off a little bit to dress the state, but not produce any real Rydberg atoms, because they were going to be a damn nuisance. Okay? So we, we don't understand this. We're trying to understand why we've got such, line broad, such broad line widths. A number of things do make sense. We get sizable Rabi frequencies. We can get two photon Rabi frequencies of around about 10 to the fifth. And they go with the square root of I1, I2, as you can see. So that makes sense. So what are our immediate goals? Well, we want to try and get the line widths of these transitions down. The only clue we have as to what might be happening is that the width of the lines depends on the atom density. As you increase the atom density, the width goes up. So this suggests that we might be getting collisions, we might be producing charged particles which would broaden things. We don't have the ability to put electric fields in the apparatus we currently have. We're trying to do that to see if that indeed is a problem. We'd like to work a little bit more with transition rates, make sure that what we're seeing is what we could predict. We are building a new apparatus in which we can apply electric fields and in which we can detect charged particles. This didn't come out too well, but it's shown here. We have a quadrant field plate like you saw in your talk, Tillman. So we have field plates above and below. We have a channel, um, a channel plate over on one side so we can square the charged particles over there. We'd like to increase the Rabi frequencies up to a megahertz with our improved 320 nanometer laser system. That looks promising. And then, of course, we're going to have to do some modeling to identify the optimum experimental conditions. What inch should you be using? What determines what densities, etc. So we're making progress, but there are some questions. We're not there yet. We, we, we've got to solve the problem with the language. 
Now, if we can solve that, what other things might we do? And there are a couple of suggestions of interesting experiments that come out of the theoretical literature, one of which was by Thomas Pohl and co-workers. Co what he suggested was you dress a BEC with light that is blue D2 from an attractive rydberg rydberg potential. So this would introduce a tunable, nonlinear attractive interaction. Now, normally, if you do that in a condensate, that's death because the condensate collapses, the atoms just come together, bang, energy is interchanged, the whole thing blows up. But the condensate will not collapse because that interaction saturates your short radii. So that's very nice. So you can have a nonlinear attractive interaction, but it saturates and will not give you a collapse of the condensate. Okay? Because within the blockade radius, this is suppressed. And theory suggests then that if you create a small BEC of the order of five microns here, then you should be able to create a soliton with a pair of Rydberg excitations in this kind of outer blue region here. And that would be interesting to try and see that. Another possibility suggested by theory is to see supersolids in Rydberg dressed atoms. Okay? A supersolid is simply a phase that has a long range spatial order in density but it can flow like a superfluid, so it can retain this dense distribution, but kind of flow. <laughs> Theory suggests that the observation for such things is favored in systems with a long-range repulsive interaction that's saturated short-range. Okay? So now we need to have a condensate that has a repulsive interaction, and we need a large condensate, because obviously the dimensions of the condensate have to be larger than the blockade radius, so we can get bunches of atoms in there. But you can do that with an 84 strontium condensate. You can form large concentrates. And then we could dress with triple S1 repulsive levels. So in principle, we might be able to see supersolids somewhere down the road. So what about the conclusions? Sorry, I've gone over a moment or two. I think that strontium allows the study of many new aspects of Rydberg physics. You can, in principle, create strongly correlated two electron excited states in a single atom and strongly interacting pairs of Rydberg atoms. You can image the temporal and spatial evolution <coughs> of Rydberg atom clouds. You can tune the atom atom interactions by Rydberg dressing. And you can create, in principle, things like matter wave solitons, super solids, and things like that. Thank you. Thank you.